Hi, uh, nice to see you all, and thank you for coming to my talk. Um, thank you for this opportunity to repeat my talk um, from yesterday. Actually, for those of you who didn't manage to come to my demo um, in 3D room, so uh, here I'm, I'm. I'm here to repeat my talk, um, the same talk, but unfortunately we don't have 3D sound system here in this room. So I'm just going to play two-channel down mix, basically. But you know. It's better than nothing. <laughs> but yeah, today I'm going to talk uh, about a psychoacoustic of 3D sound recording techniques, research and practice. Um, so firstly, I'm going to introduce myself. Um, I a senior lecturer, associate professor in music technology at University of Huddersfield in England. Uh, I'm also the leader of the acoustic, uh, psych, uh, applied psychoacoustics lab. Um, it's a a team of researchers um, with three staff members and seven uh, research students working on um, mainly on 3D audio recently, uh, but we, we do um, other <coughs> research in, in, uh, in general psychoacoustics. Uh, I was a senior research engineer at LG Electronics before I joined Huddersfield in 2010. Um, I did my PhD in surround sound psychoacoustics at the University of Surrey, and also I, I did um, my first degree was music and sound recording, a Tonmeister course at uh, Surrey University. Um, I'm also working as a freelance sound engineer. Uh, I'm going to play some of the recordings I, I did uh, as a freelance as well. Um, so I started my career as a recording engineer in 1997 in South Korea, where I'm from. And I, I moved on to research uh, when I started PhD, um, just because I wanted to make better recording. I wanted to understand more uh, human perception and do some fundamental research in human spatial hearing and uh, apply the knowledge to develop um, uh, new microphone techniques, new um, audio rendering techniques, and stuff like that. So, my lab APL, um, we aim to bridge the gap between perception and engineering. So, audio engineering, uh, we ultimately aim to create good sound, however we define the quality uh, of sound. Uh, but we first have to understand how human beings perceive sound uh, correctly. So, when it comes to 3D sound, the vertical um, stereo is, is a very important thing to understand, how we actually perceive sound vertically, how can we actually render sound optimally um, with these additional uh, height channels. So, this is a picture of our listening room. We have 22.2 uh, sound system. Uh, it can cover Dolby Atmos and Aura 3D and other formats. So, um, yeah, we do a lot of listening tests. Um, involving human subjects and um, analyze the data and provide some model and these models can be used to develop n um, new recording techniques, mixing techniques. Um, yeah. So, so today I'm going to talk about research and practical aspects of sound recording. So in research, uh, we've done uh, a lot of um, uh, studies on a vertical stereo perception. So I'm going to talk about vertical interchannel crosstalk, uh, vertical decorrelation, the effect of vertical microphone spacing in, in main microphone array design. And also I'm going to talk about some very interesting uh, phenomenon we call phantom image elevation effect, which is very important uh, thing to understand um, when it comes to 3D sound perception. So I'll talk about how these research uh, results can be applied to practical 3D recording techniques. And if we have some time left at the end, I'm going to also talk about 3D mixing and enhancement based on the research. With some two-channel demo in this case. <laughs> I should have changed this. <laughs> right. So. Um, Question, what is the optimal way of recording for 3D audio formats? Okay, so we know pretty well about how to create good sounding stereo recording, um, but um, okay, can we apply the same techniques for 3D recording? 
But then the fundamental question is, okay, how do we perceive sounds vertically with added speakers? We all know that uh, horizontal stereo is all about internal cues. The fact that we have two ears spaced apart creates a level difference, time difference, HLTF, and these cues are important for human horizontal localization. So when we change uh, level and times between channels, then these cues are translated into interoral cues, um, ILD, ITD, and uh, interoral cross-correlation, which is related to perception of spaciousness. But what happens if you have speakers arranged vertically and in the median plane? Whatever you do with interchannel differences, it won't actually change any, anything into oral differences. So already we can ask this question, okay, is conventional stereo technique applicable to vertical stereo? Well, when I say no interval changes, it's not quite true, actually. If you understand the asymmetry between two years, we don't really have same looking years, if you look into them closely. Um, so that means the HLTFs for two years are slightly different sometimes very different at higher frequencies of um, 9 kilohertz or something like that. So that means even if um, we have speakers in the medium plane, we can still have some ILDs at very high frequencies. So our localization in the vertical stereo mainly depends on spectral cues, as we know quite well. It's all about frequency when it comes to the medium plane localization and uh, shoulder reflection at lower frequencies, too. But when we have um, off-centered speaker pair, so like uh, left and the left height, then we have intoral cues as well as spectral cues. So intoral cues still take, into, uh, uh, take the effect on localization. The situation becomes more complex when we have um, double um, stereophonic layers, main layer and height layer. The, the cues at the ear becomes more complex because there are multiple signals arriving from multiple directions. And in this case, it's not just about spectral cues and intoral cues, but we have something um, yeah, we call a phantom image elevation effect. We don't really recognize the effect uh, a lot in, in normal 60, de um, 60 degree horizontal stereo. Um, ma many cases it's about expectation because we see speakers in the ear height and we think the sound is actually coming from the ear height but if you close your eyes and if, if you don't know where the speakers are you might perceive some phantom center image slightly elevated position like a vocal or snare drum and the central sources might be perceived quite elevated so I'm going to talk about this effect in more details later so I'll start with uh, vertical stereo perception and uh, related 3D microphone techniques. Oh, my slides just went back to... Yeah, okay, cool. So let's talk about this very simple um, uh, vertical recording situation. So we have a main speaker and a height speaker, and we have two microphones capturing the uh, sound source. Okay, so sound source is uh, placed on the ground level uh, at the ear, a similar height as your ears. And then the microphone array is usually raised higher. And the main microphone here, this gray microphone, is aiming to capture the source signal. And we can expect that the source is localized from the main layer position. The height microphone is mainly aimed to capture ambience in, in classical recording context unless you want to have a panning effect between uh, speakers, right? So we are recording a classical ensemble uh, in a concert hall. We want to capture additional ambience with a high channel microphone. Then the blue microphone is mainly uh, responsible for capturing the ambience, not the source. So we can actually regard the source signal captured by the height microphone as interchannel crosstalk, which is supposedly undesirable. So what happens with this interchannel crosstalk? When you have direct sound captured by the height microphone and we have this uh, perceptual influence of the crosstalk being um, upwards image shift, so you have 
the source image elevated to a high um, speaker direction because you have this uh, uh, com the combination of the sound coming from above and, and below and they are added at the same position in the ear and this has this kind of natural panning effect which can be undesirable in, in normal classical uh, recording situations because you don't really want your orchestra to be perceived up there. You want this orchestra at a similar height at your ear and then you, have, you want to enhance the spatial impression by adding additional reverb captured by the height microphones. So, how do we um, deal with this situation when, when the high channel microphone captures unnecessary direct sound? The first uh, question we can ask is, okay, can we apply time difference, time delay to the high channel so we can have a so-called precedence effect? So when you delay uh, one channel and then by about one millisecond, then the image is shifted to the other, the earlier sound, um, loudspeaker position. That's, that's the well-known precedence effect. But can this still happen vertically? If that happens, then we can use an omni microphone. For example, so we have omni pair, and these two microphones won't produce so much level difference, but they will produce time difference for the sound source. Then we don't have to worry about this image shift effect, right? So we did some listening test to see um, how effective this um, interchannel time difference cue is. So we set um, two speakers in the medium plane and uh, we applied various uh, different time delays uh, to the high channel speaker. Uh, zero millisecond, one millisecond and ten millisecond. I'm just showing these three examples here. Well, we tested uh, other uh, time delays between 1 and 10 millisecond. And the first thing we noticed is for different frequency bands, uh, these are, I don't know if you can read the numbers, but these are octave band pink noises from 125 hertz to 8 kilohertz. And they all perceive to be um, in a kind of unexpected direction. I mean, for lower frequencies, of course, when you apply 1 millisecond time delay to upper speaker, it's kind of localized in, in, uh, near the ear height. But it's not quite the effect of the time delay, but um, it's inherent pitch height effect mostly. Uh, I'll come to the pitch height effect later on, but uh, if you look at the high frequencies, for example, 2K, 4K, and 8 kilohertz, as you apply time delay to the height channels, the image doesn't actually go down, but it rather goes up. So it's quite the opposite to what you expect. So this is um, the random effect of time delay when it's applied to vertical stereo. Especially with the broadband signal, you, you can see that uh, yeah, you don't really achieve any uh, meaningful um, localization in, in the ear height. It's always elevated towards the height speakers. So that means the precedence effect doesn't really operate in the vertical stereo situation. So then the next question we can ask, now the time delay alone doesn't work. We have to apply some attenuation of the height channel um, signal. So the source signal captured by the height microphone. Then how much attenuation do we have to apply to lower the image to around the ear height? That's what uh, we call vertical localization threshold. The minimum amount of attenuation you have to apply to height channels to achieve the localization in the main layer. So we've also conducted a few uh, experiments. Um, there are various papers regarding this uh, topic, but um, this is the result from the first experiment um, obtained for uh, some musical sources. So basically, uh, regardless of time delay applied uh, between zero and 10 milliseconds, the localization threshold is about 7 dB minus 7 dB. That means you have to apply 7 dB attenuation to the height channels, then the image comes down to around the uh, main layer height, perceive the height of the main layer. So this has a very important implication on uh, microphone array design. So you first have to use a directional microphone like cardioid, and then you have to angle the microphone upwards at least um, 
to achieve <coughs> 7 dB attenuation of the direct sound. So if you use two cardioids, then you have this 90 degree position that causes about 6 dB reduction. So if you angle slightly more than 90 degrees, then you can um, have 7 dB reduction. But if you want to um, remove the perceptual effect of the crosstalk completely, then you have to apply more level reduction than 7 dB. So that's what we call a masked threshold. So the average level uh, for time delays between 0 and 10 milliseconds is just about 10 dB. So if you apply further 3 dB reduction, then you don't really hear any perceptual effect of the high channels regarding the direct sound. That means there is no perception of loudness increase, no perception of fullness increase, or any vertical image spread. Um, but, you know, this perceptual effect could actually be a positive thing if you hear some kind of vertical image spread that could be a preferable quality. As long as you have the image localized around here, then you can have this kind of extended image, you know, by applying some direct sound to high channels. <coughs> so, in terms of microphone techniques, we have to apply further angle to the height microphone, so you can actually point the microphone towards the ceiling, then you have maximum or at least a lot lower uh, level than, um, than, we, uh, than is necessary for localization threshold. So, so now I'm going to play an example here. Um, this is supposed to be for 3D demo, but I'm going to play recording made using um, omni microphone height layer and cardioid microphone height layer. So the base array was like this, one by one meter microphone array, and we added um, four height channel microphones above the, um, the main layer, so like this. The first example is just the pure omni microphones, four omnis above the uh, main array. And the second one is the cardioid microphones facing away from the source, so there is a complete uh, rejection of the direct sound. So I'm going to play these two examples, um, and I'll show you the potential effect of um, uh, using omnis as height. This was the recording venue, uh, uh, St. Paul's Consult Hall at Huddersfield University. So let me just open my Reaper. Right, okay. So first um, thing I'm going to play is the Omni, and then uh, play the Cardioid. And then I'm going to switch between Omni and Cardioid, so you can compare the sound. Helt frem til 1880'erne var Langøre den vigtigste havn på Samsø. Der var en vældig aktivitet i Langøre, og der lå mange dejlige skuder i den gode naturhavn dernede. Okay, that's uh, omni height and then cardioid height. Yes. Helt frem til 1880'erne var Langøre den vigtigste havn på Samsø. Der var en vældig aktivitet i Langøre, og der lå mange dejlige skuder i den gode naturhavn dernede. Okay, now I'm gonna try to raise the level of the omni height and see, let's see what happens. You might already hear some kind of coloration with the omni layer, because omni, uh, the presence of direct sound from high channels, um, well, in both single channels, can actually cause some comforting effect, you know, if there is delay involved. So when I frem til 1880'erne var Langøre den vigtigste havn på Samsø. Der var en vældig aktivitet i Langøre, og der lå mange der So this is 10 dB boost of the omni height. So for example, after you capture the recording, you might want to increase the amount of high channel ambience. But then Omni has got a lot of direct sound already, so if you boost it too much, then, well, you can actually increase loudness too much, and also you can introduce unnecessary coloration to the sound. But well, let's see what happens with um, cardioid height layer. Helt frem til 1880'erne var Langøre den vigtigste havn på Samsø. Der var en vældig aktivitet i Langøre, og der lå mange dejlige skuder i den gode naturhavn dernede. Helt frem. So this is another, uh, again, 10 dB uh, boost of the height layer, but 
um, it's very difficult to actually demonstrate the effect, but with high channels, you'd hear um, increase in envelopment and the perceived depth in instead of an increase in the source loudness. So you can have, have actually better rejection, separation between source element and environmental element. You have a lot more freedom to play with the high channels in that case. Okay, so that was a quick demo of the... Um, the polar pattern effect. So going back to my slides, so I'm going to um, talk about the effect of vertical interchannel decorrelation. So decorrelation is, is a very um, well-known technique for uh, unmixing, the horizontal unmixing, two to five channel unmixing, or pseudo-stereo. So you can uh, make two channel signal more different. As, as you decorrelate signals more and more, um, this, the perceived sound will become more spacious, basically. That's the horizontal um, uh, principle. But can we still apply the decorrelation to vertical stereo? And can we still achieve the same kind of effect? So we did some experiments um, comparing horizontal and vertical um, decorrelation. So here, as we e apply more de decorrelation, the magnitude of the correlation increases, then you have uh, quite significant increases in, in horizontal image spread. But with the vertical interchannel decorrelation, this, uh, the perceived vertical image spread increases. The effect is audible, but the magnitude is not as great as horizontal case. So you don't really have so much um, spread of image as you decorrelate the signal. There's a lot of thing involved in this um, result. Uh, firstly, you can think of um, computer effect. If, if you increase um, the amount of decorrelation, then the phase relationship changes. And when the signals are added at the ear, then some frequencies might cancel out. And also our perception of decorrelation itself it really relies on the fact that we have two ears spaced apart because the decorrelation is translated into interoral decorrelation, which is important for spaciousness perception, but it doesn't really happen with vertical stereo. So again, this is mostly about spectral effect. So we also conducted um, some research on the effect of vertical microphone spacing. So as you increase the spacing between microphones, naturally we decorrelate the, the, the sounds between the main and the high microphone signals. So can we increase the perceived envelopment or spatial impression by applying larger spacing? So we had uh, this microphone array PCMA, I'm going to talk about it uh, a bit later. And we added four height microphones right next to um, the microphone position. And then the first layer was at zero degrees, so vertically constant. And then 0 0.5, 1 meter, and 1.5 meters. So this research was in the context of main microphone array design. So, you, I mean, in 3D capture, there are many different methods. You can place your microphones anywhere you like, but uh, um, traditionally, tonemeisters prefer to use main microphone array to capture the overall sound. So in that context, um, with this result, um, we didn't find any significant difference between the microphone spacings. So, for example, in this case, for different sound sources, between 0 0.5, 1 and 1.5, there's not much difference. Even with the trumpet source, with the more spacing, the perceived spatial impression decreased. But with the acoustic guitar percussion, there's no really any difference between 0 0.5 to 1.5 meter spacing. String quartet, it was all the way the same. Or rather, you can see that the zero meter spacing was often um, graded to be more spatial. Um, that could be due to the influence of interchannel crosstalk and slight increase in uh, vertical image spread or fullness. So, based on this result, um, I proposed a microphone array called PCMA 3D. Uh, in fact, this was um, proposed in 2011. I didn't consider a 3D recording with this array. The original purpose of this array was to control a listener perspective, close-up um, perspective and a more distant perspective, like uh, Ambisonics can do. This array involves um, constant 
um, pairs at four different positions. And then you can control the ratio between the front-facing microphone and the rear-facing microphone. So as you do that, you can combine them without any phase cancellation because they are coincident. So as you change the ratio between the front and rear microphones, you can actually change the direction of virtual microphone. That way you can control the amount of DR ratio, um, the amount of reverberation. So direct reverberation ratio changes. Therefore, you can control the perceived um, uh, distance of the sound image. So that was the original purpose of this array, uh, PCMA. So it could be useful for um, kind of controlling um, perceived uh, listener perspective in, 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 in uh, surround recording and also in, in VR as well. So the concept is horizontally spaced, vertically coincident, but I, after this uh, research of um, vertical microphone spacing, I thought that this microphone array could actually be used for 3D capture because we don't have to apply so much spacing between vertical microphones, then it could be horizontally spaced, providing sufficient decorrelation and spaciousness, but vertically it could be coincident, like this. So if you look at it from the side, then the blue microphone is pointing towards the source and the red microphone pointing away from the source. So it rejects the direct sound completely and, and it, it's focusing on the reflection from the ceiling, um, the environmental component of the sound, whereas the source microphone focuses on the source. So OLTF 3D, it's been mentioned a lot and uh, there are demos outside. Um, so this array was actually designed based on this uh, research finding uh, we published in 2014. So I was really glad to see that uh, this was implemented in OLTF 3D. The original prototype was uh, like a bigger cube, but now it's flattened. Um, so the cardioid microphone points to the source, and uh, no, a supercardioid points to the source, and another supercardioid pointing away from the source and uh, pointing towards the ceiling. So um, the same concept uh, was applied for my own array called ESMA50, ESMA 3D. Um, this is um, a square array with um, four cardioids plus four uh, supercardioid microphones. So the spacing between uh, each microphone pair is 50 centimeters. That was determined um, by um, my novel time level trade-off function called mass model. There's a um, free app, actually. You can stimulate the localization for microphone arrays called MARS, uh, M-A-R-R-S. You can download it free from iOS app or Android. But you can see this in this picture, there's microphone, cardioid microphone pointing um, towards the source and super cardioid microphones pointing upwards. So you can um, separate the source signal and the environmental signal quite well. So we use this array to um, capture soundscapes for VR. Um, this is 360 microphone array, so when you binaryalize the setup, then you can have full uh, 360 um, uh, rotation. Um, also, this array has um, so-called critical linking concept implemented critical linking by Michael Williams means the recording angle for each segment doesn't overlap for four of these segments. So when you rotate the, um, the sound field, there is no confusion of the localization cues. So you have um, continuous 360 um, panning. And also you can have this uh, wonderful benefit of spaced array, which gives you a better spaciousness than, than coincident array like ambisonics. So you're creating a soundscape library using uh, various different techniques, uh, ESMA 3D, uh, Ambio, and dummy head. Yeah. So now another demo. Uh, I'm going to play uh, yeah, a couple of tracks from this album I recorded recently. Uh, it's re being released as pure audio Blu-ray in May. Uh, with wonderful support from chefs, uh, thanks to Helmut. <laughs> we, we got the CCM4 and CCM41 microphones uh, to record this album. Um, it's, it was recorded in 3D, so 11.0 um, uh, 
uh, format. So we have, you can select Oral 3D, Dolby Atmos um, 5.1, and uh, PCM2 channels in, in the Blu-ray disc. It was recorded in um, Oxford. There's a really nice chapel called Martin College Chapel. It's got really nice acoustics, uh, ideal for choir. Looking like this, it's not too big. Actually, it's slightly longer than, um, yeah, maybe 30 percent longer than this space. <laughs> yeah. So this was the uh, microphone setup to the choir, and we have the frontal array here, and the um, the rear array and uh, extra ambience capture uh, quite further back in the concert hall. And the light microphones, the cyan microphones are the height ones. So the, these were um, CCM41 facing upwards, and the main microphone arrays were pointing towards the source. So uh, the distance between the frontal array and the rear array was three meters, and the distance between the left and right rear pickups also three meters. So that gives you um, sufficient decorrelation between channels uh, down to about 100 hertz. So that means you can have a really wide sweet spot, and these uh, ambient signals don't really uh, interfere to each other when you go down mixing them. And the benefit of having um, vertically constant microphone technique is that uh, you can easily down mix them to 5.1 without any um, worry about phase cancellation. Because of spaced microphone arrays, especially with Omnis, when you combine them together, you always have some coloration due to comp filtering. But with a um, constant array, you don't have to worry about that. <coughs> and it's compact, so it's very easy to set up, and um, especially for location recording. So this is um, the picture of the, the frontal microphone array. So the CCM4 cardioid was pointing towards the choir, and CCM41 super cardioid pointing upwards. For the rear pickup, um, the CCM4 cardioid was pointing towards the back of the church, and the CCM41 super cardioid facing upwards. So there's some gap between these two. It's um, actually a variation of the original PCMA design, but uh, I wanted to capture a little bit of the correlation between the channels. Um, and the choir was in the front, so these signals have a really good rejection of the direct sound, which gives me a lot of freedom in, in mixing. So I'll play... Uh, I think we have time for two, two tracks here. So. Honestly, I don't know how this sounds up there because I didn't have time to um, do the down mixing here. So let's just play and yeah. This is just the front, left, right, center. With everything, so I'm combining all 11 channels into two channels. These were the height channels only, the four height microphones. The, the rear, the, the back uh, ambience mics, the first ambience mics. They all have slightly different characteristics, 
Well, if you solo them, they sound quite similar, but if you play them from uh, nine channel, 11 channel configuration, they, they kind of mix really naturally without uh, interfering each other. Okay, uh, I'll play another track quickly. goes on like this. Uh, I think uh, due to time I'll have to stop here. Okay, so this gives an idea about this microphone array. Um, I didn't use any spot mic because the, the intention was to capture the acoustics of the chapel. So no spot mic was used, no additional reverb was used. It was just as it, as it was. Uh, as you might have noticed in, in the mix window, um, there was no level balancing or anything. It's just purely just microphone signals. As, just has captured in the in the in the with the microphones. Okay, um, so another example uh, of well, maybe yeah. I was going to talk about pitch artifact, but um, with <laughs> we don't have a high speakers here, so maybe it's not relevant. But I'll play this recording anyway, and, and let's uh, talk about something else with this. Okay, so this is the Afri uh, South African Zulu um, ensemble. It's like a, a singer is singing a cappella. Uh, quite interesting sound. So. This is without height. With height. Just the frontal. The rear. And the height. The rear is. And height. Maybe you can hear a slight difference between the rear and the height. The height sounds slightly brighter than the rear. The rear picks up the warm uh, kind of character from the, the rear from the back. So uh, to me, the most important thing is to, to um, differentiate the characters of different sections of the microphone array. So you can actually have freedom to mix them uh, to create the perspective you want. So the separation between the source element and the environmental element, that's the key. And uh, with this microphone array especially, uh, again, the same approach was used, but with a smaller uh, size of the array. Um, so when you combine them together to create 5.0 or two-channel mix, there is no worry about phase cancellation. That's the biggest benefit for me. You can just fold them all together and it just becomes natural, it doesn't really get in the way of source imaging so much. So pitch height effect, you know, is a very important principle in vertical perception. So we hear higher frequencies in a higher position, lower frequencies in a lower uh, position inherently. 
So wherever the loudspeaker is, so even if the speaker is there, if you play 100 hertz sound from the high speaker, it will be localized around here. If you play 8 kilohertz sine tone from a speaker from here, then it will probably localize somewhere around there. So that was first um, found a long, long time ago and man, uh, researched by many researchers. Um, so this principle applies really um, importantly in, in 3D sound reproduction. So it kind of implies, um, you know, what, what kind of sources should be sent to high channels, even if you're mixing object-based audio. If, if the source itself has got a lot of low frequencies, don't have much high frequencies, there's no point of sending it to high channels because you're going to localize it somewhere around here anyway. But if it has a high frequency content above 6 kilohertz, for example, then it will definitely be localized at the, the position of the speaker itself. So it's very important to understand the spectral influence on uh, vertical localization. Uh, with reverb signals, usually they have quite uh, dull characteristics compared to source signals. The typical spectrum of reverb is, is like this. You have this high frequency roll of characteristics. So you can't really expect the um, reverb signal presented from high speakers to be localized up there. It will always be localized somewhere around the ear height or even lower sometimes, depending on the spectrum. So what the high channels can really add uh, with reverb signals is not really the um, localization of the high speaker. It's more of um, uh, perceived depth and the openness and the impression of being there, you know, it's, it's not about the actual height of the, the, the image. It's about the vertical extension of the, uh, the ambience image and the addition of perceived depth. The localization threshold I talked about, it actually depends on the frequency band. So if you have different frequency bands uh, measured for localization threshold, you have this kind of result. So for lower frequencies, you don't have to attenuate this so much. So for example, the 250 hertz band, the localization threshold is just about 3 dB reduction. So that's because of the pitch height effect, because these low frequency bands are inherently localized in the lower position. So you only have to reduce the high channels so much, very uh, little. But for higher frequencies, you have to apply more reduction. OK, I'll play another recording. This is organ recording um, made in Huddersfield Town Hall. We have, we have this uh, massive organ, really impressive sounding organ. Um, this organ was captured using um, the microphone array, but the concept was to capture the height of the organ. So it was not about separation between source and ambience. So both main and height microphone arrays were pointing towards the source, the, the organ. And so I'll just play this briefly. Again, I'm not sure how it's going to sound. <laughs> but uh, I'll just put the play. whole floor was shaking. <laughs> okay, so this was again down mix from all these uh, multiple microphones. Well, I had a reference stereo uh, recording here as well, so yeah. So this was a pair of DPA Omnis, 50 centimeter spacing. So again, um, the down mix of the 3D microphone array is comparable to reference two channel uh, array. Yeah, okay, so uh, how much time do I have now? Uh, do you have time? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, five, minutes. five minutes, okay, great, cool. Right, so um, just to introduce this, um, useful, um, free, <laughs> uh, 
uh, impulse response library. We, we captured um, over 2,000 impulse responses using many different types of microphone arrays and, um, and with 13 different source positions. So it was basically virtual orchestra um, simulation. So you have all these source uh, uh, speaker positions and the uh, microphone array and the ambience array, which is uh, Hamaski square, square base. And we've tried different polar patterns, different heights, uh, one meter, two meter, uh, cardioid, omni, figure of eight, and you can compare um, all the established different microphone techniques for 3D capture, 2D capture, and stereo capture. So you can um, compare like OLTF with AB, XY, uh, OCT, INA, PCMA, and all these different techniques. Uh, using this renderer, so you can use your DAW session and then feed it into this Max renderer uh, through Soundflower or Jack, and then you can render the uh, virtual recording, and then you can binaurize it, and then have a listen to it over headphones or just uh, use loudspeaker output. So it's all done within one tool using um, convolution. So there are over like 200 convolutions going on. The convolution engine we use is a very efficient max object, but uh, you, your computer needs to have a, a good enough CPU power. <laughs> okay, so um, just before I finish, I'm going to touch upon this phantom image elevation effect I mentioned. So these are the results uh, of listening test we did with multiple um, octave bands. Uh, so if you play a phantom center image for different octave bands, from the main layer, you have this kind of um, result. So the white boxes represent the height of each perceived octave band. So the most important thing here is that you have this elevation of image for 500 hertz and 250 hertz, even though they are low frequency bands, they're actually elevated higher than the actual uh, height of the speaker layer. For 8 kilohertz, it's even well elevated further. But that's understandable because if you understand uh, the directional band theory, uh, 8 kilohertz is always perceived to be uh, higher in, you know, in vertical localization. But uh, with low frequency bands as well, we have this elevation effect going on. There's uh, some pitch height effect trend. So we did further tests using um, different uh, loudspeaker bass angle. So we had 12 <laughs> speakers and then changed the, the speaker angle. So 0, 60, 120, 180, and so on. And then played the phantom center image, various natural sources, and then asked people where they hear the sound. And we had this result, which is very linear, so this is the last speaker bass angle. As the speaker angle increases, the perceived position goes up to above position. So when you have side-by-side -side speaker reproduction, you have el image elevated above you naturally. Um, but it depends on the source type. It works really well for uh, flat frequency response, transient source like white noise or rain, but slightly worse for uh, speech or pink noise. For bird and bell, is, it becomes quite random. So there is some theoretical explanation on this effect. It's something to do with interaural crosstalk. When the uh, crosstalk happens at the ear, um, the spectral notch occurring at the lower frequency region around 600 hertz is interpreted as shoulder reflection happen uh, at the ear for the real source. Because the distance, this distance is very similar to this distance. So the spectral notch occurring at about 600 hertz, that might be the cue for this effect. So we can actually use this effect for recording ambience. So instead of just using two microphones to capture the correlated ambience, I use um, another center microphone that goes to both real left and real right speakers. So you have some elevated image up there, as well as wide uh, and spacious ambience. And then we can equalize the, the center signal, so you can uh, emphasize around 600 hertz or 8 kilohertz. Then you can have some um, impression of height without um, affecting the tonal quality so too much. And there's uh, even um, a new panning method we uh, came up with using this effect. So you, if you have two side-by-side -side speakers, 
and then you apply amplitude panning between the two speakers, the image doesn't pan like this, it goes, it goes like this, in an arc shape. And then you introduce a center speaker now, and then you can pan it like this. So you can actually create virtual um, oral 3D, <laughs> or whatever speaker format in this case. And then we did um, this uh, listening test, and uh, it kind of gives quite promising result. The spread is quite large, but still there are so many people perceive the image um, around the target position. So when you aim for azimuth 30, elevation 30, it's somewhere around there. This effect is without using the height channels. So it could be useful when you don't have height channels, but you want to still perceive some kind of elevated image, then yeah, that could be useful. So I think I, I have to stop here, my time's up. <laughs> so thank you very much for uh, staying with me. And uh, yeah, if, yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, um, yeah, you can get more information from these websites uh, and email me, please. Please do cont uh, contact me if you want to uh, get the slides and the references. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Jung Cook. Okay. And uh, we still have time for one or two questions. Great. I have a question. Okay. And uh, it refers to one of the last slides you have shown. Okay. Uh, which consequences in terms of um, recording techniques would your theoretical um, um, uh, findings have? So you have said that you can create um, virtual uh -huh. light speakers. Yeah. Which recording technique would you recommend for that? Um, well, you can apply this to uh, 9.0 microphone array recording, for example. So if you want to create some kind of virtual ambient image up there at 30 degree speaker position, then you can apply this panning technique and then just pan it to somewhere around there. Um, yeah, you don't really have to use the side speakers because the, the conventional rear speaker positions at 110 degrees, it gives you almost the same result. It still elevates the image quite well. So please try, and it's, it's so much fun. And I, I listen to stereo music in this way these days because I have this wide and nice image and uh, some elevation of vocal and snare drum. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm very interested to further um, see what your results on that and what you experience you do with your yeah. um, well um, with your first. Um, and postulations. So uh, yeah. uh, I, I want to see more of these recordings, which oh, are very fine you. at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll I'll bring it to maybe uh, next uh, <laughs> microphone. Next minute, yeah. yeah, and I, actually, I'm presenting this uh, technique in the AS Milan. So if you're there, then right. please come to my session. And, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much.